Excellencies, distinct guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Keen and I am your host. Today I welcome you to the National Museum of Archaeology for day two of the MICAS International Art Weekend. I hope you are all doing fine this morning. Thank you for joining us. Yesterday we kicked off the fifth edition of the at the magnificent Auspicio Complex, which is now also the MICAS site. We also presented a showcase uh, by celebrated contemporary British artist Conrad Shawcross, What is to Become is already here. During this weekend, we are seeing why and how the Malta International Contemporary Art Space is strengthening Malta's culture infrastructure by providing a platform for contemporary art and internationalization. This morning, MICAS will be holding a keynote lecture, which will be followed by a panel discussion that will both focus on preserving the past and programming for the future. The MICAS International Art uh, Weekend 2023 is supported by the Ministry for National Heritage, Culture and Local Government, European Regional Development Fund, Restoration Directorate, Visit Malta and Heritage Malta. But to start day two and to kick off all that we have prepared for you today, please join me in welcoming MICAS chairperson, Mrs. Phyllis Muscat, for her opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the MICAS International Art Weekend keynote lecture and panel discussion. This year's International Art Weekend is rather special as it marks an important milestone on the MICAS timeline, the launch of our very first extensive on-site art exposition, What is to Become is already here. A showcase of three distinct bodies of work by the exceptional British artist Conrad Chawcross. Conrad is with us again today and will share his thoughts during the panel discussion. We are extremely pleased that the public will now have the opportunity to explore the MICAS outdoor spaces while appreciating the intriguing work of Conrad Chawcross. The MICAS International Art Weekend is about celebrating art and artists. As a public cultural organization, it's our responsibility to facilitate participation and widen discussion on culture and the arts. Part of the remit for MICAS as an international platform is to forward the debate on contemporary art and the pressing challenges of contemporary culture through knowledge, through knowledge exchange and public engagement. Therefore, these lectures and discussions aim to spur the public conversation on such issues. As an embryonic art space, MICAS is aware of the need to stay relevant and fresh in its offerings with artistic, educational, and outreach program strands that will fully engage with its audiences, neighborhoods, and communities. As we gear up for the MICAS official opening next year, we are focused on setting up the structures to help us in our internationalization mission. Therefore, before we commence this morning's program, I have a very special announcement to make. In an anticipated strategic development for MICAS, its internationalization remit and its goals for good governance, I am delighted to introduce the MICAS International Committee today. This committee will support MICAS's artistic mission by forging relationships with global art institutions, artists and museums supporting MICAS in the programming of significant exhibitions and guiding the institution's internationalization process. The committee will better equip MICAS to operate within the dynamics of the global contemporary cultural landscape. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the MICAS International Committee, Wakas Wajahat, and the first International Committee member, Timothy Rabb. Wakas Wajahad is an esteemed New York-based collector, curator, and art dealer who works closely with museums, artists, and artists' estates to organize and produce exhibitions. Timothy Rubb, who is our esteemed speaker today, 
is the celebrated George D. Widener Emeritus Director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, a world-leading encyclopedic art museum. Timothy has been celebrated as a significant and inspirational cultural leader throughout his outstanding career. His extensive experience from leading other institutions such as the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Cincinnati Art Museum, and the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College has cultivated a profound grasp of art museums' essence and mission, underscoring the necessity for their continual uh, adaptation to meet the evolving expectations of the societies they serve, both on a local and global scale. On behalf of the MICAS board, I sincerely thank Wakas and Timothy for generously accepting our invitation to join the International Committee. Their extensive knowledge and experience will support MICAS's goal of being a truly international institution. We look forward to working closely with the International Committee to achieve MICAS's ambitions, ambitious programming, and global reach. We will now commence with this morning's program. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you will enjoy the stimulating presentation and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. She has already done quite a good introduction of uh, who is going to be speaking next. So uh, please join me in welcoming the director of Philadelphia Museum of Art, Timothy Rabb, so he can deliver his keynote lecture. We will also have um, a queue and a session. Any one of you after the, the session can ask questions and they will be answered by Timothy Rabb. Timothy, please join us on stage so we can commence. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, good morning. My thanks to the leadership of the new Malta International Contemporary Art Space for inviting me to speak to you. It's a pleasure to be here and to feel the excitement about this new venue for contemporary art, which I understand will be completed and open to the public in the coming year. Now, Edith Devaney kindly sent me the several volumes that have been published over the past few years to, uh, to commemorate your um, annual art weekends and to document both the design for the new art center uh, and the several works, and we should start with the new art center, and the several works um, that have been commissioned from contemporary artists, including uh, the wonderful exhibition installation uh, 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 that shot we, sh we saw last night for the first time. Now, after reading all of these volumes, I will admit that I was a, at a bit of a loss to imagine what I could add to the conversation, because those involved in the planning and development of MICAS have been remarkably thoughtful in, in considering how this new institution is to be integrated into its historic setting, no mean feat, um, how it will function programmatically inside and out, uh, and the relationship that they hope MICAS will have with the various communities it's intended to serve here in Malta. So what insights I can share, share with you that might be useful as you move forward towards the public opening of the Malta International Contemporary Art Space next year? I think this, is question, this question is best answered by saying that I come to you as a practitioner, um, having recently retired after more than 30 years as a museum director with broad responsibilities for collections, exhibitions, educational programming, resource development, keeping the trains running on time, uh, and most importantly, striking the right balance between continuity and change. That is to say, understanding and honoring the traditions of the four institutions I have served as director, while at the same time, and always looking imaginatively to the future and determining how and why we might choose to do things differently. So let's begin then, and it's my hope that you will find the observations I have to offer from the perspective of a practitioner to be of some use as you work towards the opening of Malta's new uh, contemporary art space. And here's the, a view of the exterior and, of course, a rendering of the interior to come. Uh, and I must say, it's a very, very impressive design. 
First, and, and as a table setting uh, observation, it has been remarkable during my professional lifetime to have watched contemporary art move from the margins of the art world to the mainstream and to see how so many new museums devoted to its display be built, not only in my country, but indeed across the globe. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say um, that it is the center of gravity of today's art world, and I do not see that changing uh, anytime soon. But again, during my professional lifetime of 30 plus years, um, that has been perhaps the most significant change in the museum and the art world more broadly uh, that I have witnessed. Now, the reasons for this are various, and it's not my intention to address them in this talk. But the proliferation of, of contemporary art museums has often led me to ask, what purposes specifically uh, do they serve? Some, uh, like Glenstone uh, in suburban Washington, DC, here you see a view of, of Glenstone on the screen, are brilliant syntheses of art, architecture, and nature, but also unapologetically elitist. Elegant containers for the remarkable collections assembled by their owners, in this case the real estate developer Mitch Rails and his wife Emily, and hardly accessible to the general public, however you may choose to define that term. So here's a view of, of, of the most recent pavilions in Glenstone built, and here's a view uh, of an earlier iteration of the, the landscape and design. This, in this case, the buildings by Charles Guathme and, of course, a, a big sculpture by Richard Serra at, at the top uh, of this hill. Others, like Naoshima, the island in J Japan's inland sea turned into a museum and art park by the Benessa Corporation with an assist from the great Japanese architect Tadao Ando, and here you see the uh, part of the island um, and the high point upon which Ando built a museum for the, the corporation uh, are examples of corporate patronage in the service of an ostensibly public purpose, but again, offering a luxury good that is only available to those who can afford it. And it does take some time, as some of you may know, to get to the island and, and stay there. So here's an aerial view uh, of the museum, um, uh, an apartment complex built on the highest point uh, in the island. Um, here a view of, of an installation, the installation of a work by the British sculptor Richard Long um, in a space that represents the ambition of the founders of this complex to integrate art and nature. And I think they've done a brilliant job with it. A and then finally, um, perhaps the most famous view uh, of the, the, the island and its artworks, uh, of one of, a view of one of uh, Yoyoi Kusama's painted pumpkins squatting on a pier where the land meets the water. Now, some of these contemporary art museums or centers, um, uh, like the New Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in New York, seen here in its relatively new home of, of stacked metal boxes designed by the Japanese architectural firm Sana, uh, for site on the Bowery, in, again in New York City, are, are essentially Kunsthallen, uh, foregoing the development of collections or broad-based educational programming and serving primarily as well-oiled machines for producing special exhibitions. But beyond that, little else. In other words, they, um, they've deferred or, uh, or, 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 or given up the, the other functions of the museums like education, audience development to, um, to other museums uh, in New York. Uh, while others, other museums law, um, like the now venerable Yerba Buena Center for the, the Arts in San Francisco built some 30 years ago to designs by Fumihiko Maki have demonstrated a durable commitment to interdisciplinary programming, freely intermixing the visual arts with theater, dance, film, and music, seeing contemporary artistic production as in, in essence a kind of in, inter, integrated um, effort and, and one that should be uh, displayed and presented and considered in, in, in its entirety. And still others, like the Louisiana Museum in Denmark, about an hour north of Copenhagen, offer both, both exhibitions and collections, but integrate these into an experience of place that engenders in its visitors a spirit of delight and makes the viewing of contemporary art in galleries that are interwoven with gardens. Here you see some other views of the Louisiana Museum. 
uh, seem as natural as breathing air. Now, today as contemporary art museums or centers or spaces, these terms are still used somewhat interchangeably, continue to proliferate at an astonishing rate, we can find many different variations on these and other themes throughout Europe, the Americas, and indeed across the world. Now, as these buildings um, are completed and then open to the public, the key issue becomes what will be their programmatic focus? And more broadly, what will shape their identity? Put another way, given the host of technical and programmatic decisions it requires, creating a new museum or art center physically from the ground up is a complex task. But even more so is the challenge of institution building, imagining and then realizing a clear and persuasive vision of the nature and purpose of such an enterprise. In my experience, these two things the building and then the making of an institution are in fact two sides of the same coin. Yet they are not always, at least to the degree that they should be, considered in relation to each other, um, during, uh, particularly during the planning process, with a result uh, that what a building is designed to accomplish cannot always meet the aspirations of the staff or the expectations of the public. And looking forward, we need to ask, how can a building and its program be adapted over time in response to changing modes of artistic presentation or innovative educational practices. This, of course, is the challenge faced by those who are tasked with the responsibility for renovating historic structures. And I think it's a, a question that is equally germane here in Malta. Yes, you're building a new museum, but you are folding it into historic, a certain historic structure and historic district. And therein lies all sorts of challenges, and compl complications, and of course, possibilities. Now, a good and um, fairly straightforward case in point um, to illustrate this is, um, is the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College in rural New Hampshire. I began working there in the summer of 1987, a little less than two years after the new, a new museum building was completed um, and opened to widespread acclaim. And here you see the view of the, the new building from the Dartmouth Green. Uh, it was deployed, the building, around a series of courtyards and clad in, in red brick um, with simple detailing in response to the historic architecture of the college. Uh, it was a wonderful addition to the campus with spacious new galleries uh, up-to-date storage for Dartmouth's impressive collection of 60,000 works of art and artifacts, and an auditorium as well as administrative offices for the museum staff. It provided a lovely setting for the display of the collection uh, and the presentation of special exhibitions. However, and here I'll, I'll just show you another view from the back. Um, however, it soon proved to be inadequate for the needs of a teaching museum on a college campus. That is to say, it included only minimal teaching spaces, a small seminar room was all, and made access to the collection for teaching and research next to impossible. In this regard, Charles Moore, the celebrated architect of this new building, did nothing wrong. He simply responded to the functional requirements articulated by Dartmouth College, which themselves were fairly standard for the time galleries, storage, administrative offices, and little else. Rather, this represented a failure on the part of the college to imagine a teaching museum that would be truly different and thus well suited to serve the needs of faculty and students. Now today, some 40 years later, Dartmouth has a museum that in fact does just that, but it required a commitment to change, to correct the errors made in the past, and $60 million in renovations and structural changes to the building to get to that point. Um, but they did learn over time. Now, two of the constants in, in my career, no matter where I've worked, is that I've had to raise significant amounts of money, that is indeed the fate of museum directors in the United States, for operations, programs, collections, and facilities, and I've had to renovate older buildings and adapt them to today's needs. This has been challenging and, and in general, very, very interesting work, in part because it, as you already know, um, 
all too well here in Malta, it's much easier to build from the ground up than it is to renovate old structures and adapt them to serve different, and in some cases, entirely different functions. Um, it, it also required me to develop an understanding of what came before, what ideas shaped the plan and functions of the museums I inherited, and to ask how and why museums have changed programmatically over time. Now, Edith Devaney and Wakas Wajahat, the chair of MICA's newly formed international committee, suggested that it might be useful for me to speak with you about my experience in renewing and expanding two major museums in the United States, the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, over the past 15 years, and to share some of the lessons that we could draw from this work, particularly as these might be applicable to this new enterprise here in Malta. I'm not sure that I have much of value to offer, in part because these projects were on such a different scale, but I'll do my level best to provide some useful perspectives for you to consider when thinking about the future of your new contemporary art space. Here you see um, a view of the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, with the Schoolkill River in front of it, uh, looking from the west towards the museum and then beyond to the city. Um, both of these museums, Cleveland and Philadelphia, are old by American standards, but I should add laughably young when it comes to, when considered in terms of, of Malta's history. The Philadelphia Museum of Heart, Art, which you, again you see on the screen here, was founded in 1876 on the occasion of our country's centennial, and as such is one of the oldest public art museums in the United States. This building, by the way, um, dates to 1928 when it first opened to the public. Cleveland's museum was founded several decades later in 1913 and celebrated its 100th anniversary uh, just 10 years ago. Both have splendid, indeed world-renowned collections and they are quite large. The Philadelphia Museum of Art's main building comprises some 600,000 square feet, or 56,000 56, square meters, and is one of the largest museum buildings in the country. Uh, while the Cleveland Museum of Art's campus today is nearly as large at 592,000 square feet, or 55,000 square meters. Both are also situated within uh, important historical landscapes. Cleveland, uh, which you see an aerial view of here from around 1930, in a park designed by the, the, fr the firm of Frederick Law Olmsted, um, the designer of, of Central Park and New York and widely considered to be the greatest landscape designer in the history of our country. And the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is sited on the highest point in central Philadelphia on, at the western end of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway and on the edge of Fairmount Park, one of the largest and finest urban parks in the United States. And here you see an aerial view of, um, of the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, surrounded by Fairmount Park um, and then looking uh, towards central, the center of the city um, in the distance there. Most importantly for this story, both of, these both, both of these museums had facilities that required extensive renovation uh, and had, had long been considered to be inadequate in terms of space as well as programmatic functions to address current and future needs. In each case, the museum proceeded by first developing a master plan that took into account not only the physical improvements, the renovation of historic structures as well as new construction that would be required um, uh, but, but also considered how, how each institution might function differently in a programmatic sense. What neither process included, again, the master planning process at that time, at least to the degree that it should have, was the definition of a set of institutional outcomes. To be sure, it was generally agreed that it would be important to improve the care and presentation of the collection, most notably and most obviously providing more space for uh, for visitors to see the collection, uh, also to provide more amenities um, like bathrooms and restaurants and the like for their visitors, and to attain certain and often quite lofty attendance goals. But insufficient thought in both cases was given to other more important questions. For example, 
who in, incre in an increasingly diverse society do we want to come to the museum? Not simply how many, but those who may not have participated before. And in this regard, how would we need to change to appeal to non-traditional audiences? Again, people who had not come before and perhaps had not felt invited to the museum. Moreover, how, do we, how might we consider presenting contemporary art when the ways in which it is made and displayed um, can often no longer be accommodated in traditional museum galleries? And uh, I, in fact, see this as a major challenge for uh, older art museums like Cleveland's and Philadelphia's uh, looking to the future. Or to cite a third example, how do we move beyond the classroom and the studio, that is to say conventional learning spaces, to integrate learning more seamlessly into the experience of the museum as a whole? In other words, how might the ways we renew and improve our facilities not simply reflect the status quo, but rather serve also as a catalyst for change? And how, when dealing with historic structures, do we strike the right balance between acknowledging and honoring the past on the one hand and looking to the future on the other? So let's begin with Cleveland. Here's the, the build, its first building, uh, opened to the public in 1916. So the, this museum grew steadily over time. Here's a view again of the original building uh, that opened to the public just over a century ago. A new wing was added in uh, the 1950s, um, both to accommodate the growth of the museum's collection and the fact that most visitors now were now arriving by car. And in the early 1970s, another wing was built, uh, which you see here on screen. Um, this, in, in point of fact, was, um, was designed by the celebrated architect, uh, modernist architect Marcel Breuer, and with classrooms and studio spaces um, and an auditorium, it was characterized at the time as a museum's new education wing. It's a great building, um, but as the new entrance to the museum, which it was, I'm sure you would agree, it is perhaps not the most welcoming of ways of getting into a museum. It looks rather fortified, doesn't it? By 2000, the museum's physical plant was woefully out of date and in need of both renovation and expansion. Here's a plan of the museum from that time. I'm not going to unpack it for you. Uh, it was also the plan of, of, of something of a mayor's nest, a complicated mix of architectural styles and, and difficult for visitors to navigate. Now, to lead this effort to renovate and upgrade and improve the museum, Cleveland's trustees appointed the Uruguayan architect, Rafael Vignoli, to develop a master plan. He wisely chose to cut the Gordian knot by proposing to eliminate two of the four sections of the museum that had been built over time, retaining only the original or 1916 building as it's often, as it's often called, and that's um, in this plan at the bottom of the screen. Um, the other sections had to go and would be replaced by three new wings, parking garage burned into the side of the hill, a new power plant. And lastly, he decided to retain the building I just showed you by Marcel Breuer. Now, the core idea behind Vignoli's new vis or vision for the new Cleveland Museum of Art was cleverly illustrated in a simple drawing, which I show you on the screen here. It imagined the 1916 building, which was to be renovated as a jewel in a new setting, like a lovely frontispiece for the entire complex with the several new wings he proposed uh, to build and the renovated Breuer building deployed behind it, deployed symmetrically around a large open space, this indicated by the rectangle in yellow. Uh, it offered clarity in, in place of confusion and I think made all the difference in the world. Furthermore, he argued that such a scheme would work only if, and this is a very important point, only if it integrated public and private space and metaphorically brought the park right into the center of the museum. Hence Vignoli's recommendation for a large atrium at the heart of the museum's new campus. And that is indeed what the trustees agreed to do. 
initiating construction in 2005 and completing it nine long years later. So Phyllis, you're not the only one to deal with a long timetable. Um, at a cost of, of $330 million. In the process, the museum was entirely remade. Here you see the site plan with the 1916 building overlooking the park, right at the bottom of that, that building complex there. And the lagoon is a small lake in front of the museum is called. And behind it, a great glass covered atrium flanked to the east and west by new wings housing galleries for European and Asian art, and to the north by another new gallery wing, and finally by the Breuer building. Uh, lastly, beyond that and to the left on this image are the new garage and power plant. A radical makeover, you might be inclined to say, and you would be right. Oops. The makeover, the makeover included a completely new infrastructure. Here you can see some excavations and, and pipes going in in 2005. It included the excavation of a new basement to house collections and, and building systems. Here you see work, work going on around the main building just about two years later. A sensitive and I think successful renovation of the 1916 building which housed the first of our galleries to reopen in, in 2008. And here you see various work going on in, in different parts of that historic structure. And that included the, the transformation of the, a garden court, um, of the lovely garden court into an equally lovely gallery of, of Baroque painting and sculpture. The renovation and modification of the Breuer building, including this dramatic 700 seat auditorium. Um, and the completion of new galleries and the reinstallation of the museum's co wonderful collection in them. Here you see our new galleries of contemporary art, which opened to the public in 2009. And here is the finished product, completed in 2014. As you can see, the exteriors of, of Vignoli's wing, new wings, you can see the one more, most clearly to, uh, uh, to, on the left of this screen. Um, that was the last of the project to be completed. As you can see, these exteriors are, are clad in white marble and gray granite, visually splicing together the materials used for the 1916 and Breuer buildings. Most important, however, was the architect's use of glass throughout the project. It could be found in the galleries at the end of the east and west wings, in the corridors that connected those wings to the 1916 building, and most significantly, in the atrium. It was Vignoli's goal, of course, to make visit visitors feel in certain places as if they were out of doors, to integrate architecture and nature together, but also to make the museum as an institution feel more transparent, to enable those inside to look out and those outside to look in. In this regard, the difference between the experience of the museum before and after this renovation and expansion was remarkable and truly welcome. Indeed, the centerpiece of the project is the atrium with its great trust roof hovering above a space that is 300 feet long and 85 feet wide and dominated, as you can see in this view, by the north facade of the 1916 building a kind of salle de pas perdu, as the French call it, um, and really a remarkable uh, way of thinking about framing um, the old and, and juxtaposing it um, with the new. The 1916 building is in, in itself uh, something of a, uh, a, a picture framed in glass. Um, let me see if I can show you a few more views of that. There's another view from looking to the east. And there, the framing of the 1916 building um, with glazing both at above and on the side. Now, perhaps it will not come as a surprise to you when I say that the atrium was also the most controversial part of the entire project. There were some, including many of our trustees, who saw it as a waste of space 
and better utilized for more galleries. Still others found little utility in it. Some, what functional purpose would it serve, they asked. Uh, my answer, and I suppose Vignoli would have said much the same, was that it would function as a beautiful open space, offering a moment of respite from the path through the galleries and the rewarding but also often challenging task of looking at works of art. Where can the, an eye take, a, the eye take a rest and take the long view, connect the outside with the inside uh, before going back into the galleries? It also, if it provided a moment for our visitors to enjoy a view of the 1916 building, the sunlight coming through the glass or the pattern of light and shadow created by the trusses and their framing members, that would be a good thing and a memorable part of the time that a visitor spent in the museum. I also explained to one of our trustees that an open space at the heart of the museum, one where visitors could begin their visit and return to from time to time, was necessary in a museum that had become so large, that the atrium would function, in effect, much like a village green or a commons, a shared space around which the life, much of the life of the institution could revolve. In the same sense, I, I hoped that it would become, also become a valued civic space, one that the community would come to see as its own. This I saw as the promise of the new museum's architectural identity, and it is, in fact, what has come to pass. Today, today, the atrium is used for all sorts of civic purposes and has, over time, come to be seen and appreciated as a safe and beautiful, beautiful civic space, a commodity that is increasingly rare in American cities. Now, this process of the museum uh, com coming to be seen as a civic space that can and should be instrumental in engaging a broad community began long before our renovation and expansion project was completed, again in, in 2014. In 2009, as we began to plan for the opening of our new modern and contemporary wing, I asked our staff to plan an opening that would help us look to the future and appeal to younger audiences. For a museum whose visitors had been graying for several decades and was not accustomed to thinking about audience engagement, this was a tall order. Our staff asked me what I wanted, and I said that I would like this event to skew younger and that it should feel like a block party. I wouldn't have known how to plan such an event myself, but our staff did happily, and we scheduled that, that new event for the evening of the summer solstice. Um, if there was a moment you could point to, and this is, by the way, on the screen, this is a, a later version of, of the same event, uh, which has been repeated year after year, but if there was ever a moment you could point to as a turning point in, in the museum's relationship to its community. It was that moment, the summer solstice in 2009, when we opened the new wing and, and invited the community to the party. Now, here's how an editorial in our local newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, described that evening. Much to its surprise, the event that may have done more to lift the spirits of the, this town than any other in recent memory was the summer solstice party that the Cleveland Museum of Art threw on June 20th to celebrate the opening of its new East Wing of Impressionist, Modern, and Contemporary Art. This one had everything. Elegance, beautiful things to look at in beautiful spaces, copious food and drink, an all-inclusive mix of ages and races, live music that grooved into the wee small hours of the morning, even a classic Cleveland weather pattern that went from sunshine to rain to silverly, silvery moonlight. Most of all, the evening, which drew more than 4,000 partygoers, some 700 of whom had to be turned away for lack of space, generated a feeling of togetherness that offered the best prescription I can think of for the renewal of the city and this region, that it happened in a setting of high culture Rather than at Brown Stadium, Progressive Field, or the Q, those are three Cleveland sports venues, made it all the remarkable. In sum, the, the article uh, concluded that the museum not only had undertaken to change its look, but also its attitude. And that event, that event, in fact, set a pattern for engagement at the museum that has persisted to this day. And it's had an enormous impact, not only on visitation, but also on how the museum is perceived by the community. It took advantage of and activated 
a newly renovated facility that needed just such a change to achieve its potential. Now, before we move on to Philadelphia, I'd like to make one other point about the Cleveland Project. You recall that the addition designed by Marcel Breuer, here, here you see a detail of it, um, just completed in, uh, in, in the early 1970s, was called an education wing, uh, as it contained primarily classrooms, studios, and an auditorium. All that remains, along with one of the museum, all that remains, rather, sorry, along with one of the largest museum libraries in, in the country, thus reinforcing the museum's commitment to education with the collection serving as it should as the core resource. Now, the renovation and expansion added another dimension to the museum's education toolkit. The digitization of the entire collection, which is now available to visitors uh, both online and in a new space, which you see here, called Gallery One, immediately adjacent to the main entrance. It's an interesting experiment based on the assumption that many visitors are unfamiliar with museums and their collections and struggle to find a point of access, a way into understanding and enjoying the works of art on display in its galleries. This new space combining uh, original works of art and digital displays um, it is, simply put, a kind of orientation area, a mediated way to prepare visitors to enter the museum and to gain more from it. It also provides, in digital form, um, access to the entire collection of some 60,000 works of art, enabling visitors to find objects that appeal to them and then connect those objects with other works of art that are related to them by, by medium, style, theme, or subject. Now, unlike the classroom, the studio, the lecture hall, or the auditorium, this approach to the museum education is not about instruction or the sharing of expertise, but rather about inviting visitors to pick and choose and learn on their own. Will it be successful on its own terms, and will it be worth the investment, which was some $10 million to start? Only time will tell. But it's an interesting and important experiment, uh, and one that I think points the way to the future. Now, the development of a new master plan for the Philadelphia Museum of Art and its partial fulfillment during my tenure, it's not, in other words, it's not done yet, um, was a much larger and far more complicated process than the one I dealt with in Cleveland. Much of this had to do with a history of neglect. Its iconic building, which again you hear, see here on the screen, uh, perhaps best known um, as the backdrop for the scene in the film Rocky, where Sylvester Stallone runs up the museum steps and raises his fists in exaltation, first opened to the public in 1928, and it had not been substantially upgraded or expanded since then. I often refer to it as an, a prime example of deferred maintenance. The real challenge of, uh, in accomplishing this work of upgrading and improving the Philadelphia Museum of Art lay in the nature of the building and, it, and its relationship to its site. Um, as I noted at the beginning of this talk, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is, um, among many other things, a landmark. One of the most prominent public buildings in the city, both by virtue of its size and design, but also because it sits atop a hill, which you can see here, that is the highest point in central Philadelphia. The building is finished out on all four sides. In other words, it not, cannot be added to, at least on the surface, without doing it harm. And the hill on which it sits is surrounded on two sides by roadways, and on its third and fourth sides, respectively, by a great terrace and by Fairmount Park. And yes, it is a landmark structure, meaning that it cannot, by law, be substantially altered on the exterior. So what's a mother to do? Complicated. Yet, expansion was not only desirable, it was absolutely necessary given the growth of the collection over the past half century. When the museum opened in 1928, by my estimate, the, the, work, the collection contained about 20,000 works of art. Today, it uh, contains nearly 260,000 works. 
as well as, of course, the growth of the museum's operations and programs. Now, what's more, a long history of neglect meant that the museum's exterior and roof, the latter encompassing an area of nearly seven acres, had required substantial res uh, renovation, as did the museum's infrastructure. So, we chose Frank Gehry, better known for his curving designs and use of, of new materials than for his affection for neoclassical architecture. And perhaps an odd choice uh, for the architect uh, of our master plan, we chose him to be the, the designer. Um, and and his, uh, actually his selection for this purpose turned out to be providential. From the outset, he fully appreciated and responded sensitively to the character of this monumental building and adapted uh, uh, his design and planning recommendations to ensure that the fit between old on the one hand and new on the other would be seamless. At the same time, Gary was equally sensitive to the ways in which the museum needed to change and truly creative in his, in, in his approach to how it could be expanded without doing harm to its historic and much loved main building. This was not an easy task, as you can imagine. But in the end, we achieved an outcome that preserves the best of the past while preparing the museum to meet its needs for the century to come. Amongst, amongst the, the, the first and most important steps we took, and here I show you, I'm going to show you two floor plans, one of the first floor here on the screen and, and uh, the second floor next. Um, so among the first steps we took was the reorganization of the building to provide much needed additional space for public facing functions, such as the display of the collection and educational activities. So the entire building was essentially rezoned with many back of house functions like office and storage areas transferred to other buildings. And in fact, in point of fact, or in essence, we, we tried to make this great building entirely public facing, at least to the extent that we could. Um, now education space, for example, had always been in short supply. And when the master plan is completed um, some years hence, the museum's new education center, which is, is indicated in blue here on the right side uh, of the screen. Um, so when it's completed, this education center with a new public entrance and direct access to the mu museum's East Terrace so that activities can take place outside as well as inside the building will comprise some 15,000 square feet or 1,500 square meters, much more than we've ever had before. And the amount of the space for the collection will inc increase by nearly 50%. All this without building an addition on the exterior. Here's uh, the next floor plan. And again, I'm not gonna unpack this for you, but you can just um, imagine that um, the collection is being reorganized and represented as part of the master plan. So, how could we expand the museum and yet not alter its exterior? This was an important point and the greatest challenge to be addressed in the master plan. The key would be to excavate the East Terrace, which you see here in the foreground with a fountain at the center. A, a space, just to give you a sense of size and scale, is 300 feet wide and 300 feet long. In other words, the size of three American football fields set side by side. And to figure out a way to integrate these new spaces again underneath these terrace, remember we're on a hill so we can go down, uh, figure out a way to integrate these new spaces into the rest of the museum. So again, here's a view of the East Terrace where all the action will take place. And here is a plan, um, here's a view of, of how that will work, uh, a, a section through the center of the museum. There you can see the central pavilion and just to the left side uh, of this screen, um, the galleries proposed underneath the East Terrace, which should be excavated and the top put back on again. Now we'll, we'll look at the renderings for these gallery, these new galleries uh, underneath the East Terrace in a few minutes, but first, Let's first turn our attention to the vexing problem of visitor circulation, that's to say, how visitors will make their way into and through the building. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of things, because I doubt many of you have been to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, someone said, asked me once, what was my favorite museum? Um, and I said the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It truly is an extraordinary collection, extraordinary place. But I said, also, I love, it's so confusing, I love going into the building and getting lost in it. And in point of fact, it was very hard 
to make your way through, into and through the building and around it and really understand where you were. Now, that might have been wonderful for a museum professional like me, but for the vast majority of the public, it was a vexing issue and one we needed to, to deal with. So the master plan for the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is, um, is so comprehensive and will be so costly to complete, my estimate is that the final tally will eventually be in excess of $1 billion, that it was divided into several phases. We began the most recent one and the largest to date in 2016 and completed it in 2021 at a cost of over, just over $230 million. Now this accomplished a lot. Um, New air handling, electrical security, and fire suppression systems. New dining facilities. Um, here, uh, a restaurant designed by Frank Gehry. Um, and 20,000 square feet of new gallery space in the place of what were formerly administrative spaces. So here you can see two views of the museum's new galleries of 18th and 19th century American art, a story in which the city of Philadelphia played a major role and here on the other side of the museum in the new galleries, the inaugural installation in our new galleries of contemporary art. Um, this installation devoted to Philadelphia's art and artists today. In essence, a kind of love letter to the city and a pairing of past and present. But the most significant and complicated part of, of this work, the work we did over the last several years, took place in the museum's central pavilion. You can see the arrow above, and, and that big central space right at the heart of the museum. Um, hence the title, the core project that we gave to this phase of the implementation of the master plan. This involved quite literally the opening up of the great temple-like central section of the building and the creation of a new public space within. This was important both because circulation, how visitors entered into and made their way through the building had always been a problem, as I mentioned a few moments ago, but also because we had to create a path down to the future location of our new galleries underneath the East Terrace before we could actually build them. So here you see a floor plan at the first floor of the museum with an arrow pointing at the main visitor entrance on the west side of the building facing Fairmount Park. Directly behind uh, the primary, that is the primary entrance space called Lenfest Hall, uh, named for one of our benefactors, and beyond that, a large space once occupied by our auditorium, and now, as you will soon see, a new space. And now, in a sense set of animations, I'll show you the steps we took to accomplish these goals, again, most prominently opening up the building inside and making the process, process of entering and going through it more legible for our visitors. So among these were the rebuilding of the West Terrace, museum's main entrance, and here's an animation showing you before um, and after. And the renovation of Lenfest Hall, you see the circle there, and the main entrance hall, and the changes that took place there. Now this is a space into which all of the uh, nearly all the museum visitors first enter. Um, and, the, and here you see the final project, which involved the removal of a good part of the wall behind the staircases leading up to the museum's great stair hall. Here you can see the final result. And finally, just beyond that, the removal of an auditorium just below the great stair hall. Here's, a, here's the entrance, uh, here the new, new um, staircases going up to the great stair hall and just beyond to the right here, the area which was once occupied by this auditorium here and has now become a new public space. Named the Williams Forum, that would bring visitors down to the lower level of the museum. So here's a view of the forum and its new grand staircase. And here's a rendering, uh, here's a view of the, the great staircase, and here's a rendering for, of this same space from the other direction, looking down into the forum. 
Why was this rather dramatic and expensive step necessary? Because as I mentioned before, we needed to find a way to open up the center of the building and provide visitors with a path down to the new galleries for contemporary art and special exhibitions that have not yet been built, but will eventually be built underneath the East Terrace. You can see those new galleries beyond those two great piers in the center just beyond the Forum. Please take note as well in this view of, of the two arched openings on the side walls of the Forum. These lead to a great vaulted corridor that was built in the 1920s, but closed to the public some 50 years ago. And here's that corridor um, in the process of being changed. And here's what it looks like today. To give you a sense of scale again, um, this court is more than 600 feet or 200 meters long to show you, and you can now see how it's renovated. Now, it's a lovely thing in and of itself, but it's real value lies in its utility for the future because you can see from this rendering that this great vaulted corridor, like the Forum, will eventually serve as a threshold for the new galleries to come underneath the East Terrace. Here is where, quite literally, the past will meet the present, architecturally as well as programmatically. And I can't think of a better or more dramatic introduction to contemporary art than this. Here again, then, is the plan of that new space to come underneath the East Terrace. It's a vast space with a vaulted corridor and forum serving as a threshold to it. Um, and again, this is where the old, the historic museum will meet the new, for these galleries will be very different. First, consider again the scale. Um, the new space will be 300 feet long and nearly as wide. It, feel, it will feel spacious with the central axis of the museum kept open and extending the entire length of the new galleries. And as I noted earlier, this new space will be divided equally between the presentation of contemporary art and special exhibitions. With galleries that are as tall, between 18 and uh, 26 feet, um, as any others in the museum, and essentially open and flexible, perfect in my view for the art of our time, with a cross axis centered on a glass domed fountain uh, above, in the courtyard above, and ending in sunken gardens with views to the building above as well. And at the end of the long central axis of these new galleries, a view of downtown Philadelphia, a way of opening the museum up to the city and acknowledging that it is a reflection of Philadelphia's past, present, and hopefully its future. And when all is done and buttoned up, this may take another 20 years, um, but it will happen. It will seem from the outside as if little has changed, but inside there'll be many differences. Although it's self-serving to say so, I, in this case I think we made the right decisions honoring the spirit of the building while bringing it up to date and adapting it to current and future needs, and acting, equally importantly, as responsible stewards of a great public monument. This also, however, begs an important question. Is it enough to ensure that the museum remains a, li to ensure that the muse museum remains a lively and vital institution appealing to a broad audience, especially the young? Um, is what we've done sufficient to, to really con to, to, to achieve that goal? The answer, I think, is, of course, no. It's not sufficient. And this is especially concerning in terms of a building like this, which, while noble and inspiring to some, may seem remote and inaccessible to others. Now, if you doubt whether this question is relevant, and I will admit that I once did, let me share with you a, a somewhat silly story. When I became the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum in 2000, so 23 years ago, um, here's a view of, of that museum from around 1940, I said publicly that I wanted to bring the museum down off the hill. Um, you can see here that it's located in a great public park. What you can't see is it's on a hill overlooking uh, the city of Cincinnati. Uh, of course, I meant that metaphorically speaking. Um, but of course, I'm, I said it because I wanted us to form, forge a stronger connection 
with the community. Now, towards that end, I asked our staff to do a survey of perceptions of the museum within the community. Happily, they were generally quite favorable, but the responses to the building, a great classical pile dating to the late 19th century and added to over time, caught my attention. Fully half of the respondents called the building grand and inspiring, which I had expected. But the other half simply asked, who's buried there? Now, if indeed, as is often said, architecture is destiny, then we should be asking if the historic buildings we have inherited and do so much, not only to maintain, but also to improve, are helping or hindering our work and are an asset in terms of engaging audiences. The answer uh, I, is still, I think, that they are helping. But today, as we deal with increasingly diverse audiences from different cultural backgrounds, as is certainly the case here in Malta, we have to work harder than ever to ensure that such buildings and the settings they provide for the display of works of art remain both engaging and meaningful to those audiences. There is, I hasten to add, no guarantee that they will continue to do so in the future. But with our landmark building in Philadelphia, a great monument to neoclassicism, and the wonderful architectural settings and period rooms in which the museum's collected, uh, collection is presented. Here are two of them. Uh, on the screen, a cloister from a Romanesque abbey in southwestern France, um, dating to the late 13th century. And here, one of my favorites, a drawing room designed in the 1760s by the great Scottish architect uh, Robert Adam for a townhouse in London. So with these great settings and period rooms, we have an obligation and more importantly, an opportunity to bring the past into conversation uh, with the present um, and ensure that it remains a valued resource, that is to say the past, not only to help us understand and hopefully value what has come before, but also to understand and value contemporary life and art as well in the fullest measure. This is certainly what Marcel Duchamp that most iconoclastic of, of modern artists had in mind when he chose Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, as the place where visitors could come to see the full scope of his work. Here's his great large glass from begun in 1917. Because he knew that seeing it in the context of a great historical collection was essential to understanding its meaning and ultimately, ultimately its significance in the history of art. Now achieving this, again, bringing the past into conversation with pre the present, and sometimes working against type when it comes to these great pub public monuments of the past, this will require us to throw the doors of the museum open as widely as possibly, possible, both literally and metaphorically, uh, and to make the museum also metaphorically as transparent as possible. Again, and I will end on this note, I increasingly came to believe that the key to doing this was programming with the goal of attracting specific audiences. In Philadelphia, our focus was on the young and on people of color. We programmed with these goals in mind, opening free of charge on Wednesday evenings, partnering with community groups and other institutions to offer programs and events of all types, dance, music, theater, poetry slams, digital workshops, and family days, to name just a few that would attract their constituencies, and did so on a consistent basis throughout the year. And it worked. Within four years of introducing these initiatives, the percentage of visitors who were people of color increased from 15 to 30 percent, and the median age of our visitors was 30, dropped to 33, much younger than it had ever been before. One Wednesday evening several years ago, I was walking through the museum with the director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And as we made our way through the galleries of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, which were packed with a diverse crowd of young people, he turned to me quizzically and asked, what the hell's going on here? He could not only sense the change occurring, but see palpable proof of it. I answered him with that familiar phrase, new wine in old bottles. And when we exhibited the work of Zoe Strauss, a great contemporary photographer from Philadelphia, and made the opening affordable. 
to her, uh, and appealing to her friends and admirers, inviting them to party, uh, to a party DJed by the famous Philadelphia uh, musician Questlove, there was hardly room in the great stair hall to move, um, as you can see in this image. A staff member wrote to me the following week that she was never prouder of the Philadelphia Museum of Art than at that moment. So, I guess my, my advice is play against type, um, have some fun. Yes, look to the past and honor it, but also keep your eye on the prize, and that's what's to come. Thank you very, very much for your time and attention this morning. Thank you very much, Director Rob. So now is the time to ask any questions. We will have people with microphones. Just raise your hand and you can ask any questions. Okay, we ask you to, to stand up so everyone can see you when asking the question. Thank you. Interesting talk. Um, contemporary art has never been more expensive than today. Um, how have the contemporary art museums that have been in business for decades managed the fact that it's no longer contemporary after 20 years? What, what happens? Once, um, <clears throat> once upon a time, the Whitney Museum of American Art had a, an agreement with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, very short-lived, that once a work of art reached a certain age, it would be transferred from the Whitney's collection to the Mets. Uh, in practice, that never worked out, but um, one, of, one of the key issues going forward is what you do with these historic collections, and some um, uh, the collections that have become historic, in, in essence, over time. Uh, I think the best example of that is the Museum of Modern Art, which essentially began as a, as a contemporary art museum in the, the late 1920s. Um, but has, has over time morphed into something quite different, um, uh, but still maintained its commitment to, to contemporary art. Uh, the challenge there is you, you have to grow and continue to grow to accommodate um, your collections. Um, uh, and, and, and over time, um, you have to become a very different kind of museum. So I, I think the answer uh, really, and, and the, the logical one is that Museums of contemporary art, if you want to call them that, should really be contemporary art exhibition spaces. They should be more focused on presenting and sharing contemporary art with the public and less on collecting. In part because, um, as you suggested, um, collecting is a very expensive undertaking. And, and uh, that's a, a, another great change in, in my lifetime. It used to be um, fairly inexpensive, relatively speaking, for museums to acquire contemporary art and therefore a lot of fun. Um, and that's the way it was during, at, at the beginning of my career. Uh, now I can say quite honestly that the collecting of contemporary art, um, even for a museum like Philadelphia, is the most expensive enterprise of its collecting portfolio um, because of the nature of the marketplace. Um, the, the fact is that, um, I, I think, to answer this another way, um, museums like Cleveland and Philadelphia um, have increasingly recognized that they need to be in the business uh, of collecting and, and making decisions about contemporary art. Um, not only because it's, it, 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 it's about audience engagement um, and about, about the very interesting and really, really important task of connecting past with present, but also because um, collecting habits have changed, um, not only in the United States, but, but across the globe. A hundred years ago, your major collectors in Philadelphia have been collecting drawings and prints, old master paintings, um, Asian art, and the like. Uh, today, I can count people who collect in those fields on one hand in the city of Philadelphia, whereas the collecting of contemporary art is prolifer prol proliferated, and that's where all the action is. Happily for us, those people who collect contemporary art in Philadelphia and in, in other major cities in the United States are, are still moved by the philanthropic impulse to share those collections with institutions like ours. And the most important donations that have been made to the, the PMA, as we call it, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, over the last decade and more have been collections of contemporary art. So we'll see what, what will come.
Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, which I really uh, uh, enjoyed. I had the privilege to also visit the Philadelphia one, although I admit that the uh, statue or uh, bust of uh, Rocky Bal Balboa on the steps didn't, didn't go quite, quite well with, 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 with me. I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, first of all, about the finance of such uh, enter enterprises. So, uh, how are these funds uh, financed? Are they private finance? Are they by visitors? Are they receiving uh, government subventions? Uh, second question is, um, in the case of Malta, where the uh, market is rather small, I mean, we, we are almost half a million, uh, how do you see um, attracting enough visitors to keep the momentum going? Uh, I mean, I refer to MICAS. And my third and last question, is about how do you see contemporary art museums uh, competing with other conventional museums, such as fine arts mu museums? So are they competing for the same market or they have a, a different completely market? Thank you. Okay, well, I'll try to remember all of those questions. First of all, funding's, funding's pretty, pretty easy to talk about. It's, it's also a very complicated thing because it differs from museum to museum, but most museums in our country, save for a few places like Washington, D.C., are funded um, by private funds. Um, uh, there are, in many cases, um, uh, models that combine both private and public funding, often from states and, and cities. Uh, but in, in Philadelphia and Cleveland, fair to say that most of the funds we, we received came from private support. Now, having said that, um, it's not as if we had to raise uh, funds for all of our operating budget each and every year. The, the operating budget for Philadelphia just before the pandemic uh, was close to $65 million a year. Um, and a third of that, so about 20 plus million, uh, came from endowments. And most museums over time, big museums especially, have created very large endowments for operations, for acquisitions for programmatic purposes like education and the like. So one third of our funding was, was reliable. It came from a very large endowment each year. Uh, one third of our funding um, came from singing for our supper, from, from raising funds in the community, from, from individuals, from, from foundations, sometimes from governments. Uh, so about 20 million there. And about 20 million then came from, uh, from operations and from memberships. So people coming through the door, paying, paying admissions fees complicated, but it's an important source of income. And then uh, a very significant number of members, about 40,000 each year, um, paying some money to be part of the museum's enterprise because they, they believed in what we were doing. So that's one thing. Um, of course, I've forgotten the, the other two. I, I th Well, there's certainly, there's never enough money to operate the museum where we do our best. Let me answer the question about uh, contemporary art. Uh, I, I, it, it's increasingly, increasingly diverse marketplace for contemporary art. Um, and, and I think we're still sorting through uh, what respective roles um, large and small institutions, institutions that are general, like the Philadelphia Museum of Art versus specific, like the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, um, will play in what also um, role the marketplace will play in terms of presenting works of art and sharing contemporary art. Um, it, it is competitive, I think increasingly so. Um, it, it, and I, I think what's, what's making it interesting today, particularly in our country, um, is that um, the resources for showing contemporary art um, are increasingly concentrated in a, in a few very large galleries in places like New York City, Gagosians, Werner, and the like. And uh, I, I would wager that they have um, typically more resources to put on exhibitions um, today and, and produce publications than many public museums do. Now, um, with regard to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, we not only uh, showed contemporary art, but we, we also tried to put it in context. And, and that's, of course, uh, what, a, what a great general art museum can do. We can, um, again, put the present in conversation with the past, um, show contemporary art in juxtaposition with historic art, 
Um, also, uh, make some choices about who we believe are, are the most durable voices in contemporary art uh, and devote major retrospective exhibitions to those. So those, may not, uh, those exhibitions may not be about art that was produced in the last five or even 10 years, but they may be uh, significant, very ambitious surveys of work of artists who've been working in the field for 30, 40, 50 years for a lifetime. Um, and that's the, the role that a great public museum like the PMA can play. So we have, we have only time for one last question, because then we need to move on to the next bit of today's event. So one last question, please. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much. Welcome. I'm interested in the healing power of art, the holistic healing power of art. As the gentleman before me mentioned, we're in a very small, highly populated um, insular country, and the issues of health, mental health, um, well-being, resilience are extremely important, as are in many societies. I'd like to know what you think about the healing power of art. Well, since I've spent my entire career in art museums, I, and I, I, I think, I, I fair to say, I think they've contributed to, to my well-being. And um, we talk about, um, museums as um, places apart, number one. Um, uh, uh, place, the place of muses, uh, of inspiration, um, of transport. And I, I do think they, they, in terms of wellness, in terms of mental health, I think what they do, can do best are two things. One is feed the imagination. Um, in, in the sense of, 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 of opening to us, often in unexpected ways, new possibilities of seeing and thinking. That's what great artists do, do best. Um, and that in itself, the sense of transport, uh, the sense of, of bringing you to another place, physically and, and, and in the museum itself, because um, they are, most of these are beautiful spaces, and I would say that Cleveland and Philadelphia certainly are, and have that capacity. Um, are, they are in, in and of themselves restorative and, and very important for, for people. And I, I know this from experience and from, from talking to many visitors and seeing them in the museums. So, so that's, that's one thing. That the, the issue these days, at least in the United States, is that um, museums have, are not only, not simply relying on themselves as places and as, as repositories for work of, works of art that can have that effect, very beneficial effect on people, the way they think and feel, um, but also we have moved in the last couple of years, and that's been accelerated by the pandemic and the movement towards social justice that has been on everyone's lips in, in the last couple of years. We've moved towards programming, towards programming that really is focused on those very issues, and that's entirely new for museums. I'm not sure that they know how to do it altogether well just yet. Um, we had been doing that already with certain groups, obviously with, with children and students, but also with special groups like military veterans and the like who may have been traumatized um, in their work, um, but increasingly it's become the focus for a lot of, of programming in museums, and that wasn't the case before. So I, if, if, if I can imagine an arc of change for museums going forward, I think it will be that that will remain the focus um, for, for some time, okay? Well, thank you again for your time. I think it's time to get some coffee, okay? So, <laughs> apologies. I know I said... I know I said one last, one last question before, but if we can have you for just a, a short question and a short answer, please. One last one. Promise this will be the last one. My question would be, why are contemporary art spaces relevant to society? Uh, with your experience, I think that is a very important question to answer and motivate finances that contribute to their creation and upkeeping. 
So could you repeat the first part of your question, Mark? Why are contemporary art spaces relevant to societies? To societies. What was the word before that? Relevant. Oh. Yeah. Well, um, there, there are some who would say that contemporary art spaces and museums aren't terribly relevant to societies. I'm not one of them. So um, in the way that museums are, um, as, uh, as repositories for um, the creative production of, of, of society, particularly of cert certain societies, um, it, it is, I think, a really important thing um, for the cultural record, for, for, um, for, for to, to sustain people's memory and understanding of what came before. Now, contemporary art and contemporary art spaces um, offer different possibilities, and, and they, they offer an opportunity for, first of all, for people to see the production of contemporary artists, both uh, of their own city, country, but also uh, uh, of other places. Um, and they also offer an opportunity to, and I think this is for me the, the most interesting aspect of, of contemporary art spaces today. They, offer, they show to the public the new ways in which artists are thinking about their work, the materials they use, what they want to say. Now, th that may seem an obvious point, but there have been few times in history, one could argue there really hasn't been any time in history until now when the nature and, and pace of innovation and change in the production of art and also the, the repositioning of the function of art in society has changed so dramatically as it has in the last several decades. Uh, it, for me, it's, it's, it's always exciting and always challenging at the same time to figure out what to show, um, why it's important to show that, maybe about a social message, maybe about um, stylistic or material innovation. It may be just about uh, the way someone sees things or, or cares to express herself, himself. Um, but it, it, it is a fact that contemporary art has, has, has continued to change and, and evolve in ways that are, I really think are, are absolutely extraordinary. And as I pointed out in my talk, um, it, is, it continues to change in ways that challenge um, traditional ways of, of presenting works of art in museum galleries. It is ex increasingly difficult for us to accommodate the presentation of contemporary art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. We weren't built to do that, not only physically, but we weren't built as museum staffs to do that because it, uh, it's, it's a rule-breaking enterprise now in, in wonderfully, uh, wonderful and wonderfully um, challenging ways. Uh, and so contemporary art centers, I think, provide an opportunity to clear the decks, to not think about the past, and to really say, what's happening now? So that's my provisional answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Timothy Rubb. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of part one of today's event. We're going to have a short 15-minute comfort break. Uh, we will ask you to return here because we are also live on uh, Facebook today within 15 minutes of this comfort break so we can continue with the second part of this morning's event, which will be a panel discussion. So we will see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>